On behalf of Jack and his family, we welcome you here today to the service to celebrate the life of Anne Passmore and to give thanks for the blessing that she brought in so many lives and to affirm her solid confidence in the resurrection of the dead and the eternal gift of a home with Christ in heaven. This is going to be for uh, those of you who are of Baptist background, it's, it's gonna seem like you're perhaps in the right church but the wrong pew. As uh, Anne has asked for us today to follow the guidelines of the Book of Common Prayer for uh, our service, which makes perfect sense uh, given her early roots in uh, what some may call the Church of England, but Anglicanism. So as we gather today, we do so with uh, her direction and the inclusion of uh, tenants that were especially uh, important to her. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, from henceforth blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so, saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. In grief and also in profound thanksgiving, we come to this house of God, to a place of prayer, to a church where remembrance and hope are sacred duties. Here, where Anne Passmore worshiped, we give thanks for her long life of selfless service and ensure confidence to commit her to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. With admiration, we recall her lifelong sense of duty and dedication to her family and to the disenfranchised of our community. With thanksgiving, we praise God for her constant example of Christian faith and devotion. And with affection, we recall her love for her family and her commitment to the causes she held dear. Now in silence, let us in our hearts and minds recall our many reasons for thanksgiving, pray for all members of her family, and commend Anne to the care and keeping of Almighty God. Let us pray. Merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who has taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We, meet, we meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is this our sister doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight, and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our mediator and redeemer. Amen.
Almighty God, who promises that when two or more are gathered together in your name, you are there. May your spirit sweep through this place and bring peace and comfort to those who are bereft. And Father, may the constant uh, assurances of your word allow us to leave this place with the confidence in uh, living in this life and the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Would you be seated? I guess that's low enough. Uh, this loving tribute that um, I'd like to give for Anne was really Jack's uh, eulogy for her, and I worked with him in collaboration. So we hope that in this way we can honor Anne, and um, she was such a blessing to so many people and an inspiration. Anyways, Anne was born in Bristol, England in 1942. She was the third child. She had one sister and two brothers. And you could say that the family at this time was economically and emotionally challenged. Her father came and went, and eventually her mother was left caring for the three children alone and working at Fry's Chocolate Factory. Anne, being very bright, was the only one in her primary school to win a scholarship at a grammar school. Her mother could only afford a second-hand uniform, but it clearly identified her as going to the grammar school, which led to some harassment by the local neighborhood children. Nevertheless, encouraged by her teachers, she did well and um, was fascinated by this whole world of learning and um, opening up so many things to her. Even then, the church became really important to her, and she was nurtured by the members of St. Barnabas Church, where she learned about the love and mercy of God. When she was about four years old, she was cared by some nurses while her mother was having her brother buried. She loved this, and she developed a strong desire to become a nurse. So subsequently, she trained at, in Bristol at the Royal Infir Infirmary. And it was during that time that Anne met Jack, who was at a student dance. Well, he was um, a student at Bristol University. As they got to know each other, they enriched each other's lives. Anne took Jack to classical music concerts and to church. Jack took Anne to the pubs. <laughs> it's, it's worthy to note that going to the concerts and going to church remained a constant in their long married life, but the pubbing did not. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jack was very impressed with Anne, especially by her spending many weekends at home um, cleaning her mother's house. She, he saw this as a really big plus to her character. Apparently there's more ways than um, to a man's heart, not just through his stomach. But she was definitely a keeper. They loved each other, and in 1963 they became engaged. However, Jack's family lived in Victoria, British Columbia, and um, Jack was um, going to take up a fellowship there at UBC. But nevertheless, they got married on July 4th, 1964, after they both graduated. And six days later, Anne left her world and her family to start a new married life here in Canada. They were lucky enough to live on the campus of UBC in an apartment with the stunning view of the mountains that was so inspirational. And Anne had many hobbies. It was a great place for her to live was in British Columbia because she liked walking and she liked gardening and of course she liked going to concerts. 
And um, this all came to her quite naturally. Her mother also had a great interest in nature and in growing things. And she had an uncle, and this was a big deal, Uncle George, who was a gardener to Lord Bath. And that was considered a big honor. And I guess he used to send her and the family maybe some flowers from the garden or from the woods. But if you've ever seen Anne and Jack's garden at their house, it's, it's amazing. And, um, and uh, Jack designed the layout of the garden and Anne planted the flowers. Jack plants the vegetables and trims the hedges, but it's really a lovely garden. Anyways, in 1966, Janet was born, which gave them great joy. And in, nine, and in uh, I guess it was about 1968, but anyways, Jack's work brought them to Burlington, Ontario, where in December of 1968, Anne gave birth to triplets prematurely by a couple months. One of them died, and the other two were quite handicapped. And as was the advice of the day, they were encouraged to leave the more handicapped son in the care of professionals. This was firmly rejected. In 1969, they moved to Fredericton, and this was at this time in Fredericton was where they uh, dedicated their life centered around the care of the complex needs of their boys. In those early years, Anne wanted to ensure that Jack had the time he needed to carry out the intense uh, work at UNB, his academic studies. She, cheerly, she cheerfully was backup player in the Jack and Anne team. And they were a team. They were always a team. However, Jack, um, Anne had to carry the heavy burden of lifting and caring for not only just twins, but two handicapped twins. And at that time, Janet was only about three years old. And plus, she also took over many of the other household tasks that uh, Jack used to do, and this all added to her load. Within about two years, though, Overwhelmed and exhausted, she returned to England in 1970 for the first time since immigrating in 1964. Jack's mother came and looked after the family while she was away for about three weeks. This was the first time since the twins were born when she was in England that she slept soundly all night. Because she was exhausted and due to overall lack of support and no family here in Canada to really help out, she felt strongly that she could not return to Canada. But, however, listening to a sermon that seemed, directed, seemed to be directed right at her, she heard God calling her back and she returned. And this definitely was a calling for her and that God had given her a special job and purpose, and she dedicated herself to that. But once again, this difficult workload um, led to a second emotional break breakdown in 1981. However, on the positive side, Jack's academic research led to a year in Würzburg, Germany in 1976 and 77 and they were able to take David with them. And um, John, though, stayed at a highly acclaimed facility in St. John. David went to school, a school set up especially for children of special needs. They had a swimming pool and everything else that could help. The staff spoke English and they were very well educated for the task. And the extent of hospitality shown to them was amazing. Janet went to German school and learned German. Um, and, and at one point, a German family was found to look after David in their home to allow Anne and Jack to go on a three-week three educational tour of Germany. Anne enjoyed this so much, and she thrived 
on this academics in this academic setting and other academic settings that they were able to enjoy together. And they also spent time with family in England. And um, this is where Anne could see what was done for the Davids of this world. So this trip to England and Germany opened her eyes to what was available and, and provided a goal for her of what she wanted for her boys. When they returned from Germany, however, it was evident that Johnny had fa uh, fared very poorly and it took many months of Anne's love and attention to restore him back to the boy she knew and loved. The contrast between care in Germany and England was a catalyst to improve the boy's situation and she rose to the occasion. Anne worked, as we, all, as we know, to establish and improve the quality of services not only for John and David, but for the mentally handicapped in Fredericton. She worked to have her sons fully included in the community. When services did not exist to adequately support David and John, she was determined to develop them. The strange thing is, Anne once told me that she didn't feel she had accomplished much in her life. And I think she really believed that. But as most of us know, she took leadership roles in the community. And I'm just going to read some of these to you. Um, she took leadership uh, roles in a Fredericton Association of Community Living and the New Brunswick Association of Community Living and Jobs Unlimited. She was a founding member of Opal 3 and was both an amazing volunteer and a strong community leader. She was given many awards and honors for her volunteer work in Fredericton and volunteered for years for Meals on Wheels, Red Cross, Heart and Stroke, and Salvation Army, and the Third Age Center. She was also a founding member of Stepping Stone Senior Center. That was news to me. <laughs> I didn't know that. Anyways, all these things, she was absolutely amazing. And this just dem demonstrates what love, devotion, and tenacity, and Anne was very tenacious, but that all can achieve. But it was hard convincing Anne that um, she had accomplished a lot in her life. At one point in this journey, um, Anne fought on many levels of government to have her son John taken out of a nursing home to live fully funded in his own apartment. And she won. And later, she had to repeat the whole process again for David, and she won again. Absolutely amazing, I thought. She loved learning. If she didn't know something, she would enroll in a class, such as learning how to swim and life-saving skills for the sake of her children. And, uh, and, and Keith and I, from our experience, know that David just loved the water and would just take off and uh, enter a lake or uh, I think with this particular time it was at Mactaquac. He had no fear. So I can see why she would want to take um, swimming lessons and life-saving skills. But in, in her 40s, this was a major change for Anne. She went to UNB and graduated first with a BA and then a master's in English. And um, her thesis, there was a picture on the slideshow there, was The Preacher and the Poet. I'd like to read that, actually. She loved her community and her church. She was dedicated to missions, both overseas and, and um, uh, locally. She was active in the seniors exercise class and um, she was involved in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. That's where we met them, Ann and Jack, and Nurses Christian Fellowship. She also loved and cherished her friendships and always made whoever she was with feel special. She had a gift for that. As time went on, 
And once things were more settled and established, and they could, uh, there were safe places uh, provided for the boys and good care workers, Anne and Jack had more time for themselves. And this is a quote from Jack. We were privileged to enjoy extended times in wonderful places, allowing for many enriching experiences together, walking in beautiful places and making new friends. For Anne, this gave her times of, to recuperate and, rejoy, and regain her joy. I see a poet in the making here, Jack. <laughs> However, I remember even though the things were established, there always seemed times when there was relentless search for caregivers and accommodations, things could break down. And they certainly got a lot of help from FACL and NBACL over the years, but it always seemed that at times there was always a struggle and it never seemed to end. But as time went on, it was less frequent and less intense, so they, um, they certainly could, uh, things were certainly improved. About a year ago, though, Anne was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and she bravely fought it, as we all knew she would. She spent the last months at home, nursed largely by her daughter, Janet, until she went into hospice. And I have to tell you that Janet and Terry have been amazing. They moved into Anne and Jack's house with Alex so they could take care of Anne, which she greatly appreciated. Janet continued working, teaching, at, and, but added making the meals and being on call for Anne during the night. They slept in the same room. Anne's health deteriorated. As Anne's health deteriorated, the demands on Janet increased. So Janet took a leave of absence so she could spend more time. I guess quality time, as we say, but a lot more time with Anne. At, at hospice one night, when I was there with Jack and Janet, the topic of how Janet felt growing up, living in the shadow or in the, living with her brothers who needed so much attention. And she said she always felt included, supported, and loved, which is a real tribute to Anne and Jack. She was part of the team. She helped with the boys' care. And Jack recalls seeing Janet at about eight years old helping Anne with the heavy lifting and the physical needs of the boys and he said she looked just like a mini Anne. And getting to know Janet, renewing this uh, time with Janet in the last few months, I think she is a mini Anne. Now this family is, is an amazing family and they really loved each other. And if you look at the slides, you can just see it. You can just see it in their faces and, how, and they, how, much, how happy they were together. They tried to do things together, to have fun together. When possible, they went out together. The boys were never excluded. I, I actually met Anne and Jack on, um, about 40 years ago, I think, at a sheep show. And at this sheep show, there was Janet and the boys, and um, just the whole family together. They were gifts from God. And if you have that reader thing that was published in 1999, the picture on that is absolutely beautiful. And I have seen that once or twice with, between Anne and David. And um, once I saw David fleetingly just touch, touch her face. And Jack could always get a good laugh out of Johnny. And it was just an amazing family. It was, an, and it was a normal family. They took the boys everywhere, including church, and, um, and visiting they, when they came to homes and things like that. And um, so I, I just think it's wonderful. It was a struggle. It's a struggle. It continues to be a struggle. But what family doesn't have struggles?
Um, I've known Anne and Jack for about 45 years, but in the last six months, I got to know Anne a lot more in a more personal way. And it was obvious to me and obvious how she spoke of how much she loved her family. Jack was her true love and soulmate. Janet was her friend and ally, and she had, uh, and had a special place in Anne's heart. Terry was very much appreciated, and jo Johnny and David were loved and, de and um, out devoted to, Anne was devoted to them. Her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren brought her great joy. And to all her family, you were all very special to her and she loved you all profoundly. When she was at home, she had a caregiver during the day, but the family took care of her in the evening and overnight. After supper, Jack sang hymns that she liked and prayed with her, and they read the daily bread together, which was always an encouragement and pertinent to their present situation. Anne usually wanted one more hymn and often fell asleep while Jack was singing. Anne was comforted by her faith and given hope and said that she just wanted to go home. And on October 7th, her wish was granted. So Jack and Janet would just sincerely wish to thank you all of those who had cared and supported them over the years for so, and for so many years. And for all the friends, workers, caregivers that, um, that were, helped them during these last few months and over the years. Thank you all. The first lesson. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is a law. But thanks to be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Thanks be to God.
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Thanks be to God. Thank you. Please be seated. In his book, Abba's Child, The Cry of the Heart for Intimate Belonging, the late Brennan Manning wrote, 
the insistence on the absolutely indiscriminate nature of compassion within the kingdom is the dominant perspective of almost all of Jesus' teaching. Let me just read that again. The insistence on the absolutely indiscriminate nature of compassion within the kingdom is the dominant perspective of almost all of Jesus' teaching. Indiscriminate compassion and Passmore understood, understood indiscriminate compassion. An understanding rooted in her experience of God's grace in her own life. He had walked into Anne's life with indiscriminate compassion and she accepted the gift of grace in a way that changed her. Not unlike Manning, Anne was infused with God's indiscriminate compassion and grace allowing her to walk into situations which would be uncomfortable or distasteful for many of us. Her experience of God's indiscriminate compassion and grace gifted Anne with both a willingness and an ability to walk in another's shoes and to discern the present need. This I experienced personally, especially in the last two years of her life, indiscriminate compassion. In Abba's Child, Manning quotes from Anthony DeMello's book, The Way to Love. Consider this definition of indiscriminate compassion. DeMello writes, what is indiscriminate compassion? Take a look at a rose. Is it possible for the rose to say, I'll offer my fragrance to good people and withhold it for bad people? Or can you imagine a lamp that withholds its rays from a wicked person who seeks to walk in the light? It could do that only by ceasing to be a lamp. And observe how helplessly and indiscriminately a tree gives its shade to everyone, good and bad, young and old, high and low, to animals and humans and every living creature, even to the one who seeks to cut it down. This is the first quality of compassion, its indiscriminate character, end quote. As with the rose and the lamp and the tree, Anne was unable to stop herself from showing compassion where it was needed most, in the lives of the marginalized and set aside. And on the other side of the coin, she was instilled with the vigor of the temple cleansing Jesus for those who stood in the way of remedies for such need. It's the thing with people who have a servant heart, indiscriminate compassion, a willingness to give and not count the cost. Those of us with whom Anne shared her life openly and honestly knew that she keenly felt the cost of her calling. It took a toll. Her sacrifices took her to places that most of us would never want to go. But the fervency, the power, the intrinsic nature of her calling would not let her recline. We might argue about the need for her to recline, or the wisdom of such living, or the cost to effect ratio, but she would not be deterred. Similar to the servant heart and indiscriminate compassion of her Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, I can't help but remind you of Paul's words to the church at Philippi, a letter written maybe 65 or 70 years after the life of Christ. Stories of Jesus' servant heart were still fresh in the minds of those still living who had walked with him as well as with their descendants. This ridiculous Messiah who turned the wisdom of the world right side up by showing how power is really lived out. Paul's writing to people he loved. In believers, he had helped to grasp the love of Jesus, and this letter's intention is that they should live it out everywhere. Paul writes, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, 
any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being found in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. From suffering sacrifice to exaltation, and this was Anne's confidence as well. Facing her imminent death, Anne was not desolate because she fully anticipated that the moment of dying would bring the first moment of an eternal life that would be free from any injustice, any need for temple clearing action, any pain or sorrow, any longing, any unfinished business, just wholeness peace and joy in the Savior's kingdom. She held as truth Paul's words to the Romans in the eighth chapter of his letter. I consider that the suffering of this present time, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. And again, verse 28 and following, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And not, as you notice, a new life of isolation, a life of intimate, unmitigated joy with Jesus and his people, his people who have gone before and those of us who will come after. As Jack and I began to talk about this service, he was captivate, captivated by the thought that both Anne and the late Queen were women of indiscriminate compassion and faithful servanthood. And so this service has been modeled on that of Her Late Majesty. And so on this theme of Christian confidence in and anticipation of the life to come, which both women held dear, I'm taking the liberty of quoting from the royal funeral sermon of Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury. And he wrote, Her Late Majesty's broadcast during COVID lockdown ended with, We will meet again. Words of hope from a song of Vera Lynn. Christian hope means certain expectation of something not seen. Christ rose from the dead and offers life to all, abundant life now and life with God in eternity. As the Christmas carol says, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. We will all face the merciful judgment of God. We can all share Anne's hope, which in life and death inspired her servant leadership. Service in life, hope in death, all who follow Anne's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can with her say, we will meet again. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen.
I would invite you to join me by reading the sections in bold. In confidence and trust, let us pray to the Father, O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us. Save us and help us to humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Graciously look upon our afflictions, O Lord. Pitifully behold the sorrows of our hearts. Make thy servants to be numbered with thy saints. O Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, did weep at the grave of Lazarus, his friend, look, we beseech thee with compassion upon those who are now in sorrow and affliction. Comfort them, O Lord, with thy gracious consolations. Make them to know that all things work together for good to them that, are, that love thee, and grant them evermore sure trust and confidence in thy fatherly care. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Confident in God's love and compassion, let us pray for all those whose hearts are heavy and with grief and sorrow. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously and greatly with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. In recognition of Anne's faithfulness to family and to the oft overlooked and set aside, let us rejoice in her unstinting devotion to serving, her compassion, and her counsel to the leaders of church and community. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose will it is that all thy children should serve one another, look with love, we pray, on this community. Grant to its citizens grace to work together with honest and faithful hearts, each caring for the good of all, that seeking first thy kingdom and its righteousness, they may possess all things needed for their daily sustenance and the common good, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We give thanks to God for Anne's loyalty to the faith, for her unswerving devotion to the gospel, and for her steadfast searching of the scriptures. Let us pray. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household and church in continual godliness, that through thy protection she may be free from all adversities, and devoutly given to serve thee in all good works, to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that we may be given grace to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life. Give rest, O Christ, and thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign, but life everlasting, where thou, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Father of all, we pray to thee, those whom thou See no longer. 
Grant them thy peace, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In confidence and hope, let's, let us pray to the Father in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
following the commendation and blessing, uh, the family will be leaving the sanctuary. We invite you to follow row by row to the reception that's been prepared in the church gymnasium. And uh, then maybe after that, Jack will take us to the pub. <laughs> Let us commend to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer, the soul of our sister Anne. Heavenly Father, King of Kings, Lord and giver of life, who of thy grace in creation didst form mankind in thine own image, and in thy great love offerest us life eternal in Christ Jesus, claiming the promises of thy most blessed Son, we entrust the soul of Anne, our sister here departed, to thy merciful keeping, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, when Christ shall be all and all who died and rose again to save us, and now liveth and reigneth with thee, the Holy Spirit, in glory forever. Amen. Go forth, O Christian soul, from this world, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is poured out upon thee and anointed thee, in communion with all the blessed saints and aided by the angels and archangels and all the armies of the heavenly host. May thy portion this day be in peace and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church and all people peace and concord, and to us sinners life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.